I'm Jessie Janae. I'm the CEO and founder of Lumi, and you are in Lumi HQ, uh, and we make packaging for modern brands. So the, the talk today is meant to be uh, useful. It's meant to shed light on like why young people in LA are building a packaging company. Like I actually get that question. They're like, it, you know, it's, I think it's, um, it's not necessarily what they would expect when they see me, like packaging entrepreneur. Um, so, so I think that I want to explain why, how we've come to this, and then, um, and the goal of it is for it to be useful. So we're going to do Q and A at the end, um, but also if you have a burning question, like feel free to just shoot your arm up in the air. I'm more than happy to like talk through that as we go along as well. So don't be shy. Um, anyone who's shipping something you know, from point A to point B, a product is, is e-commerce. Uh, but when we think about what we're building at Lumi and who we're building it for, uh, we have a more um, specific definition and it really excites us about like where the future of products is even going. Uh, so I wanna dig into that. And the place I'm gonna start is by talking about a Medium post that came out. Um, the writer was Andy Dunn. He's the CEO of Bonobos. And I actually am not, oh yeah, the, the date on this post says May 9, 2016. So Stefan and I, my co-founder, had been about um, a year, we, we founded this business in January 2015. So we had been a year and several months into running our business. And this, e this post by Andy Dunn came out on Medium and we were like, he got it, like that's why we started this business. And I think it's a really interesting insight even as an entrepreneur that sometimes you have these ideas percolating and it's hard to articulate them. And then someone comes along and articulates it really beautifully and you're like, that's a good one, like you got it. <laughs> you, really, uh, you kind of really encapsulated something that we've been thinking about but that we didn't have the words for. And so Andy Dunn did that for us where um, he defined this term, digitally native vertical brand, and he has since kind of shortened it to VCB, vertical commerce brand. And he makes this argument that, um, that a lot of the excitement around e-commerce brands and a lot of the brands that you hear about these days um, kind of growing really fast and making a huge consumer impact, it's not just e-commerce. It's not just that they're shipping products on the internet. Um, it's that they're actually a certain new breed of brand that he's defining as, as vertical commerce brand. And, and the reason this is really important to us is that it really brings into focus why packaging is so important in 2017, 2018, and beyond. Um, so I'm gonna define that and kind of, I'm gonna use some of Andy's terms here and then, um, and then we'll go from there. So to, again, anyone shipping things from point A to point B is doing e-commerce. Uh, you know, I'll give an example. Um, Macy's, uh, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying something negative about Macy's, but Macy's, you know, obviously we all know it started out as retail stores. They also have a thriving e-commerce. Um, but when you get a box from Macy's that you've ordered online, um, it's typically filled with products from a bunch of different brands. You can put anything in your cart from, you know, hundreds of different brands and order it on Macy's. Um, and this is this kind of a counterpoint, like that is, um, not, in his opinion, a vertical uh, VCB. So what is a VCB? Um, one like, key trait is its primary means of interacting and kind of growing its brand is online. And it's typically born online. So a lot of the brands that fit this definition um, you know about, like Warby Parker, Casper, Dollar Shave Club, um, and I'm sure the list goes on and on. There's hundreds and there's new, being, new ones being born every day. It's a brand that's vertical. So going back to, again, what I just mentioned about Macy's, um, Macy's ships hundreds of, of different brands and you can order that and get it in a Macy's box. A typical VCB, when you order from Warby Parker, you're ordering a Warby Parker product. And so the relationship between that product and the packaging is really different. When you get the Macy's box, it's because um, you, like, to identify who you ordered it from. But when you get that box from Warby Parker, the box is an extension of the product. The box is an extension of what those founders are choosing to kind of communicate to you because it's all one branded experience. They vertically integrated. And the same is true for a lot of these brands that fit this definition. A third thing, um, 
is that these digitally native brands are really customer focused. Now, there's actually a reason that they can, one, this is a good business choice, right? To be very customer focused, but there's, but there's a deeper reason um, for why they can often afford to do so. And it's that it's a classic kind of um, margin equation. Uh, we'll, we'll like, I think touching upon Casper mattress would be, would be a good example where the typical um, mattress buying experience in a physical form um, can, feel as a li can feel a little snake oil salesman, like, you know, they all look kind of similar and, you know, it, clearly you're supposed to leave the building with something. Um, but Casper can be so friendly and, and really be consumer focused. Um, and, and part of it is that they are selling it directly to you. So they can come at you with a fair price um, because, they're, because they don't have to cut in a bunch of intermediaries and salespeople, et cetera. Um, and the last point here about what kind of defines these companies, even though they start online, ultimately they start spilling into the physical environment. So this kind of like caps back to their packaging. So they focus intensely on the product, intensely on the customer experience, and then they, um, and then you'll see like now Bonobos has guide shops in New York and other major cities. So now they're actually coming into the retail environment, coming into more of your physical space because they've built such a deep relationship with you. So this, I don't, you know, some of you may have seen this news, um, but to us, um, the, the reason I put this up here is, um, something that really inspires us is that these brands using this model are having a really big impact. This is not like a cutesy uh, business um, choice. You know, th there, there's businesses like Dollar Shave Club uh, that are selling, you know, that sold to a billion dollars um, to a really established company. And they're challenging, you know, a lot of the classic uh, consumer packaged goods uh, businesses that thought they had it all figured out. Um, and so, Again, this is just deeply inspirational to us because we see how empowering this is for entrepreneurs, that how empowering this is for people out there who have a great product idea and want to bring it directly to people um, and how they can really have a big impact. And in a relatively few amount of years, um, I actually don't remember how, exactly how many years old Dollar Shave Club was from inception to billion dollar acquisition, uh, but in the scheme of things, the, these businesses are growing and having an impact really quickly. And, and from our perspective, the reason I'm sharing all of this with you, even though I'm not dropping packaging wisdom quite yet, is that these are the underlying trends that we see that make packaging important, uh, that make it more than a box. Um, of course, you need a box to get your product from point A to point B without being damaged or broken uh, or you know, just to arrive safely in condition to your customer. But what these businesses are, are doing, um, besides crafting this incredible relationship with customer and bringing really high quality products to market because they don't have to cut in retailers and middlemen and distributors, is they are creating a new dawn of the importance of packaging. Because something that we uh, often say at Lumi uh, in, internally, basically, is that the packaging is, uh, is a modern storefront because these companies don't start out with a storefront. If you are Casper and you have your mattress, um, the only physical touch point that you have with your customer aside from the mattress is that box and that experience that showed up on their, do on their doorstep. That's it, aside from other marketing activities or and of pop-up shops and stuff that you might do. But the vast majority of your customers will never meet you in person. They'll never have a physical experience with you or shake your hand or look you in the eye. They see your box and then they see your product and they either love it or they don't love it. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it beca it's becoming so much more of a critical aspect of a brand than um, a transportation mechanism. And these things obviously excite us. Um, again, I'll, I'll rewind a second and give a tiny bit of Stefan and myself's background. He's Stefan is my co-founder. We started out um, studying industrial design at Art Center in Pasadena. 
um, here in the LA area. And we founded our first business together was a physical product business where we were the manufacturer. We um, developed a product. It was a DIY product that we took to market. Um, and we took it, we sold a lot on e-commerce. We were doing fulfillment ourselves as well as we, um, we, we took it to retail. We, we did a lot of different um, experiments with that product. But through the course of building our own product-based business, um, something that Stefan and I realized, we always cared about good packaging and good design because we were designers. But something else we realized about the entrepreneurial experience that inspired us to start Lumi.com was that so much of the entrepreneurial experience just keeps getting better and better. Um, I'm sure I'm not going to be the first person to tell you about a lot of incredible tools that exist for entrepreneurs like Shopify for launching your store, like Square and Stripe for processing payments, or MailChimp for sending out incredible, beautiful you know, newsletters to your audience. Those tools, uh, as, sometimes when you're an entrepreneur, those tools feel like a godsend. They feel like uh, this incredible thing that like someone had thought of all the possible mistakes you were going to make when you launched your store and built it into something that you can pay $30 a month for. And what fascinated us about that is that we launched our product-based business first. This, it was a fabric dye. that we, It was called Inco Dye. We launched this business and we felt so incredibly supported digitally by all these people that had come before us and built Shopify and built Stripe and everything. And then when it came to shipping our product out, it was like the record player stopped. Like it was like all of a sudden people were asking us to fax them paperwork, fill out forms in blue ink because like they wouldn't accept it if it wasn't filled out with a blue pen. Like things that like felt very, I, I, I was about to say like very 1980s, but I was like, I don't even think in the 80s that's like normal. Um, so it was this interesting experience of kind of like smooth process, like so much of the entrepreneurial experience had been thought out. And then on the physical side, making our packaging, managing our supply chain, it was incredibly rough. So that again is all inspiration that makes us excited to run this business of Lumi. So this is a, a packaging suite for a brand um, called Ugmunk. They're a customer of Lumi's. And I, I put this up here just to kind of, it's just like a statement. It's like, this is a beautiful set of packaging. Uh, Lumi makes most of those items except for the little business card items there, but we make all of the packaging. And, um, and I just wanted to touch upon this um, of how how much packaging there is out there. Uh, I've been talking about boxes. It's really normal when you think of packaging to think of a box. Uh, but one of the first questions we often ask an entrepreneur reaching out to us is, do you need a box? Um, is that the best item for your, for your uh, product? Because there's you know, poly mailers, and there's craft mailers, and there's all sorts of different envelopes. And you could do custom tape instead of boxes uh, to make an impression. Look at Amazon. Amazon uses tape and I'm sure you all you know can blink your eyes and imagine what it looks like because you've seen it a million times um, so so just keeping your mind open of how many packaging options are out there and part of what we are also passionate about is making all of those options available to e-commerce entrepreneurs in one low in one place so that you don't have to go out and seek a tape guy and a box guy and a poly mailer guy because as an entrepreneur trying to start your business, let's say it's a swimwear business, our philosophy is that you should focus on swimwear supply chain. You should be meeting with the manufacturers and working on that, um, but you shouldn't have to become a corrugate box expert to launch your swimwear company. Um, let us work with you on that. And in that, and I say that in um, with like such an open mind, meaning that we don't try to box people out of knowledge. If customers want to understand more of what goes into producing a box, we're uh, always there to explain it and explain what goes into these processes. But if you don't need to know that, if you don't want to know it, or if one more piece of information will push you over the edge that day, then, <laughs> then we are also here to, you know, to, to use our expertise in that area. And I think that that's, that's what reminds me, even though we make packaging and Shopify makes Shopify, it, that's, that's what reminds me of that. It's like there was a time pre-Shopify where 
entrepreneurs starting an e-commerce element to their business were developing the software themselves. Each one of them was like, we need to make a shopping cart you know, aspect. Like, and they, they had to hire developers to build them a shopping cart. Um, it feels like a million years ago. It was like nine years ago or 10 years ago. And so that, I think that speed of, um, of progress is so incredible. And we're looking to bring that to, to some of these physical elements. So, so this is, I just put this up here, th th just to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, this is actually a hypothetical um, d purple donut company. Um, <laughs> um, I know it's a hot, I didn't want to leave you guys with too many good ideas. Um, but this is a hypothetical pur purple donut company. And, uh, but this is what having a Lumi dashboard for your brand looks like. And I just put this up here, like this is not an advertisement, I put this up here to just kind of conceptualize again how many components usually go into a good packaging program. It's like, it's not just one item, and that is why it takes so much time usually to put together a good system. So I want to go into what does this mean? So I hope, I hope you guys are getting a, more of an understanding of why we do this and what excites us about it. Um, but in terms of taking some of this and, and utilizing it for your own brands, here's some things that we have learned by working with hundreds of brands um, that, that I want to share with you. Make your packaging an experience. This um, is something that is very important. The, the most important aspect of your packaging is that your products get from point A to point B, but the, assuming that your products can get to, the, to their location safely, making it an experience that becomes a core to your brand experience is so important. So I'm gonna run through a couple of things about what I mean there. How many of you have heard of Me Undies, the brand? Yeah, they're here in Los Angeles. Uh, so we make the Me Undies pouch, uh, that plastic pouch that those that those uh, that their product ships in. Um, this hashtag hashtag Me Undies, and they have several amazing hashtags. So this is not by all means all of their photos, but this hashtag Me Undies. This has over ten thousand social posts, and what you can see by just glancing at the top posts is I can spot packaging in four, at least four, of their top nine posts that I see when I just like search their brand. That is incredible to me. That, you know, I mean, I make packaging, uh, so obviously I get really geeked out on this stuff, but, but the thing that, but I really think that from a numbers perspective, it is fascinating. It is fascinating that their packaging is driving so much social sharing. And I really think that it's not something to be ignored. And the experience of receiving a Meandy's pouch, it's made of a slightly different material than a standard poly mailer. Um, they heat seal the um, lip of the pouch, and I have some here that we can look at after. They heat seal the lip of the pouch, so you actually have to tear it open. It kind of feels like a freshness seal. It's actually a type of packaging that's mainly used in food, and they put underwear in it. And so that experience of like, opening that with like a freshness seal and feeling like your underwear is like definitely fresh and awesome and you're about to like put it on and and do what that guy's doing taking a selfie in his bathroom that we're all looking at um there's life choices um <laughs> so you're doing that and 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 you you take this moment to to snap a photo like you you are excited about this purchase and you take a moment to snap this photo and think about it, like there's only so many things that you can take a photo of when you receive an e-commerce package. So it's highly likely, as long as your packaging is thought of as an experience, that, that, um, that it's going to be your, that it's going to be the packaging. Um, cool. Blue Apron, another experience. Um, people seeing it on your doorstep when you're approaching a home uh, makes you know that you're going to have a great dinner that night. Um, so again, kind of thinking through how iconic that is, you can tell when you're like a block away that your Blue Apron is sitting on your doorstep. Is that experience fun to share? Yes. I hear people complain about Blue Apron all the time. Yeah. The, the insulation. Yeah. Cooler. I had Blue Apron for a while. Yeah. 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 So, so a good point was brought up. Some Blue Apron comes under a lot of criticism for the amount of waste in their packaging. Um, that um, 
that is that is something that all of these brands contend with. That is something that we as consumers and, and VCB companies are going to have this constant give and take about. Because the more that we are shopping online, the more that these products are need some transportation mechanism. And in their situation, it's perishable food. So they, they have to make certain choices. That is something you know that is it's uh, is very hard to draw judgment on. I've seen case studies or like white papers that they've written about how the packaging is actually less than like what products can go through by the time they go from grocery store through different distributors and then to your house. It's hard to know, right? It's hard to know whether that whether how much truth there is in that versus what you're experiencing. Um, we don't make that packaging quite yet, um, but. But something that we think about that I did also include in my, in my tour was that the, we like to whittle the packaging down to how simple and how, how, um, how much can it blend with the product experience. And I think what you're experiencing with the Blue Apron, even though they're doing it by necessity right now, is that sometimes the packaging actually becomes like it overpowers. You've got like a little egg and it's like wrapped up in a crazy thing. And so that I think is, um, I don't, we don't believe in that. Like we would ask ourselves, how could it be whittled away to as little as possible? But those are tough choices, especially imperishable. Oh, sorry. So is that experience fun to share? Um, I'm gonna, in the Meandies one, I think that you know the answer is yes. Um, but I'm gonna show another example. Um, we don't work with this brand yet. Um, how many of you have heard of this brand, anyone? Yeah, so they make a coffee scrub. Um, and they have some really fun hashtags, like let's be frank, uh, it's called Frank. Um, and it's, you know, it's a fun coffee scrub. But again, I spot a lot of packaging in, in their top posts, you know, uh, people standing with the package, uh, the tube, packaging just like sitting with other <laughs> items on a, on a table. Um, and um, in kind of their, their actual product is a scrub. Like you can see it on that girl's face. It's like a brown mealy scrub. So the only visual that people have to kind of make a statement of like, I'm with the Let's Be Frank is, um, is the packaging. So they, without that element, they're, it's like a brown paste and it's hard to explain like what brand they're kind of showing off. Um, so I think that is a, kind of a fun example. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't show you the insane um, spectacle and, um, and trend that is unboxing videos. So this woman <laughs> is, and it just kind of really kind of like drills back down to how much the customers really do care. Like if you are an entrepreneur and you're about to ask yourself like, I don't know, what's the difference between an unprinted box that costs 20 cents and a printed one that costs 45 cents? It's the fact that a woman is about to spend 11 minutes explaining this box to her friends. Okay, like she, and then it has 7,000 views. That's the difference between 20 cents and 45 cents um so so you you not, you need to kind of let that sink in that this is like table stakes now that to have a product that people are talking a lot about that they, they snap photos of just because it arrived in their like mail um, is some level of customization. Uh, she's talking about a nasty owl purchase, um, and she later like holds up the box and like talks all about it. Um, but I think it's just fascinating. And then lastly, does your packaging support your brand? Um, the reason I throw this in is that the last thing you wanna do is make a bunch of fancy packaging because it seems like a good idea or you think it's gonna look really good at Instagrams and miss the boat on it supporting what your brand is about. We don't advocate doing more fancy packaging or more printing or fancy things just because it's gonna look cool. Um, it needs to be supportive. So in this case, uh, this brand Rockets of Awesome, they make children's clothes. And their box, uh, they, they um, encourage you to use the box as like a little fort for your kids after. And to disassemble the box and let the kids just like go wild with it. Because like, let's, the kids love boxes. And kids don't love getting clothes. So they're like tempering that. They're like, Wait, you just got your kids some clothes. Like, give it the box. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I think that's really fun and self-aware, right? Um, and, and then this is another one where uh, Threadless, um, their, their poly bag says great art in a sw squishy bag. Again, it's very self-aware. It is a very inexpensive uh, bag. We actually make this for them. 
And it's, um, again, it's just, it's sort of making an awareness of what your customer wants. Like, this is such a fun, cute thing to, to get in the mail, but it also says like, hey, you want a good, like a reasonable deal on this t-shirt, we support artists, like we're not spending a, a lot of money on this package. So that's it, I wanna, I'm, I'm totally open for questions, whatever you guys wanna know, um, yes. The question is that they, they're looking through the samples in the office and they're asking, we didn't see a tube, um, like a shipping tube, uh, and that is a, like a core fulfillment um, package that, that many brands use. We don't have a lot of brands that use them, so you don't see a lot of them like floating around in our sample zone. We have a couple that um, have kind of gone that direction, but for the most part, tubes, um, the, especially with a lot of the new changes around dimensional weight shipping, um, where brands get charged for how much space their product takes up as well as um, how much it weighs. Tubes, unless you have something that's very good in a tube, like a poster, um, tubes can be more expensive than other options. So that's kind of why you don't see a lot of them. Okay, the, the question is about sustainable packaging um, and then then there's several kind of brackets that we're, that we're gonna talk through. We think about sustainability a lot here, especially since we're participating in an industry where a lot of materials get produced, uh, used, often packaging has a very limited life. Um, so you need to think about that. You don't wanna be creating this solid, you know, thing that ends up in a landfill, you know, a few days later. And um, so there are several things we think about. One is um, we counsel our customers on the difference between something that they think is sustainable versus what is actually sustainable. And I'll give a, a perfect example of that. Um, we sell padded mailers. I refer to padded mailers like they have any sort of padding on the inside, um, like bubble or there's other ones that have foam. People see the paper padded mailers, so they're like craft paper on the outside, and people like just, uh, associate craft paper with like a sort of sustainability element. Combating what people think is sustainable is, is something that we do every day. Another thing that we do, um, changing the defaults. So uh, when people order poly mailers, um, plastic poly mailers, which uh, it's like a plastic shipping envelope that's common in fashion. And something that we'll do is just automatically spec in uh, the highest amount of recycled content that can work for that order, for that particular design, whether the customer requests it or not. So that can have some pretty profound um, effects because we have orders for plastic mailers where the total weight of the order is like 8,000 pounds. Well, the difference in an order that is 8,000 pounds of plastic, whether you spec in 60% recycled material or 100% virgin material, is pretty in, is pretty intense of a difference. So you're talking about thousands of pounds of plastic difference um, in how much uh, came from used kind of stream. Um, and, then the, and then the last thing I'll say is that working with the manufacturers, um, the manufacturers are not out there to ruin the planet, like they're good people, I've met them all. Um, they're really, they're, they, they have great intentions and some of them are extremely hardworking at sustainability. So the question is, do, so if you start a product, you have a product, but you don't have packaging experience at all, do we help them adapt or kind of, I think, what's the onboarding process? We are designers at heart, so we provide a lot of design counsel and what I call design execution, uh, but we aren't a design agency. You can't come to Lumi and say, um, I want, you know, we know we need a box, can you show me five ideas? We don't kind of do, um, like spec work like that, we can uh, pair you with a designer uh, who we like working with to do work like that. But a lot of brands come to us and they generally they know what they need. They're like, I know I need a box. I know I want it to be, these are our Pantone colors. We Here's our logo. And we will help you execute that properly. We will counsel you on like, you know, you're, you want to you, you at least make it this big because when you do flexographic printing on corrugate, you're going to lose the fine details if you don't make it that big. So the counsel of like taking an idea from execution or from from, um, from kind of a firm concept through to execution, we do all of that. And if you're earlier than that, you need the logo still. You need to know like just generally like packaging concepts. We'll pair you with a designer who will probably be a good fit for that project. 
So the question is, what pers um, what's the right amount to spend on packaging? What is reasonable, basically? And um, of course, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question, but I really enjoy it because I actually, we really believe that brands should choose a packaging that fits the unit cost of what they sell and what their average order size is because that's the only way you're going to keep using that packaging. And actually, that's what we care most about. We don't care about selling you as much packaging in the first month that we meet you. We want to be partnered with you for many, for, for the whole life of your business. Um, so to answer that question kind of specifically, a good rule of thumb is that packaging for an item should cost between like point between half a percent and three percent of like your total basket size. If you're customer spends $100 when they shop with you, generally, you know, you could have a box that costs 50 cents, you could have a box that costs $3, depending on how fancy you want to get with it. And that, of course, should include everything you put in the box, the tissue paper, the packing slip, etc. Now, so if someone's checking out for $30, then you need to, you should be spending like, you know, anywhere from 15 cents, which is super low, that would be almost no, no customization to, uh, you know, 75 cents, you know, roughly and things like that. So um, it gives you a range. You might need to buy a little bit more of something to get into a custom product. But as an example, like if you're, if you, if you came to Lumi and you said, we're shipping 100 things a month or 50 things a month. We're not going to recommend custom boxes. Custom boxes typically have a minimum of 1,000 pieces or something. To a brand starting out, we might recommend custom tape. Uh, use a blank box and ship it with awesome custom tape. Getting into custom tape might cost two or $300. Um, and that's like usually on the affordability scale for someone just getting started. So um, the question is like, do we do alternative packaging, uh, things that could be kind of uh, multi-purpose or reused? Um, and she mentioned like a cloth backpack for clothing or something of that nature. We have worked with brands on projects like that. Um, we. Again, our focus is fulfillment packaging, e-commerce packaging. So that does mean we end up having a lot of outer boxes and, um, and poly mailers and things of that nature. But we do like to offer everything from the outside of the box, like all the way in to before it touches the product. Where Lumi falls on the spectrum is on the um, sourcing supply chain end of things. We still would pair you with a designer if you were like, I think I want an interesting bag, I'm not sure what. Um, we really come in when it's spec'd out enough where we can be like, yes, like we can get that for you within our network of manufacturing. Yeah, how many of our suppliers are in the United States? Um, I actually remember on a per supplier basis. So we work with over 54 manufacturers, or over 54 exactly right now, and, and the network is growing. Um, I can tell you um, that like, 90 plus percent of our revenue comes from things that we're making here. The, it is kind of a misconception that like that everything, and I'm sure you know, uh, Z can talk to this very well as well, that, um, that everything is cheaper elsewhere, that you're getting a better deal um, by getting something overseas. You lose a lot of time and you also have really high um, shipping rates and freight, uh, shipping and freight as well as customs fees. So when you factor that all in and when we work with brands, like obviously they're most interested in their landed cost for that product, only certain product categories are more advantageous overseas. Corrugate, for instance, all the boxes we're talking about, I was like, far and away most likely made in the US because they are bulky to ship. So, uh, you know, we're making those in Southern California, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, not overseas unless it's a very specific project for some reason, uh, has a very specific um, mechanical or like equipment need. Um, and our thesis around like who we work with as manufacturers is really based on their level of expertise, uh, their ability to work with us on the materials we want to use, the level of quality we want to offer, as well as the equipment that they're running. So this is something that is important. Like these, all this stuff, when you visit, visit a box manufacturing facility, there, there's some beautiful facilities here in Vernon uh, within the you know 15 square miles. Um, they're a city block. Like it takes a city block to make a box from scratch where paper, rolls of paper come in one side. If you know what guys called corrugated boxes, like there's a machine that just takes flat paper and like makes it all curly and corrugated and then laminates it in between two boxes, like all in a huge line. That is happening here in Southern California. Um, and so if you are here in Southern California, likely the best 
price for boxes and the best way to get them so you get them like 10 days after you order them and stuff like that is from that facility here. Uh, so it, it's, um, we make supply chain choices based on what is good for getting the best quality product to market for that individual component. Um, but of course, whenever we can, um, and more often than people would assume, the answer is here. Um, thank you so much for coming. I hope that there was, this was some useful information. Uh, I appreciate you humoring me as I deep dive into the geeky world of like corrugated boxes. Um, and uh, and you know, and this is Lemmy HQ. Feel free to wander around and, and take a gander. Thank you guys so much for joining us.